Welcome everyone. My name is Lorna Schumann and I'm an educator at the Illinois State Museum. We are so pleased that you could join us tonight. So thank you for joining us for our program on Elizabeth Smith Friedman, poet, codebreaker, and Nazi hunter. Well, I know many of you have been looking forward and we are very excited and honored to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Jason Zagani, who's going to talk about a pretty well unknown heroine here. And so without much ado, I'm going to turn this over to Jason. Jason. Lorna, uh, thank you for that kind introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to the Illinois State Museum for setting this up. I hope you're all doing okay, staying safe. Um, I hope this talk is entertaining or educational for you. Uh, I understand that there are some teachers here. So uh, shout out to you all, um, uh, what you've been doing for kids during this um, uh, really difficult time of COVID has been heroic and, um, and, uh, and wonderful. And, and I know it's been, been hard. So, um, so I, I appreciate all that you do. Um, if, if anything in this talk strikes to you and you want to, um, ever teach kids about Elizabeth Friedman or, or, or the world that she lived in, I'm happy to uh, provide you with materials too. So just let me know. Um, also, the, the, uh, Elizabeth herself got her start as a teacher. Um, so, uh, so that's one connection to, uh, to Illinois. Um, and the other one is that uh, Elizabeth got her, got her start in Illinois. She's not, a, um, she's not a native Illinoisan, but she did some of her most important work here. Um, and, and she sort of began her, her, uh, her code-breaking adventure in Illinois under absolutely spectacular circumstances that I'm gonna tell you about today. So, um, so yes, this is Women's History Month. Um, uh, and this is to talk about one of the most amazing uh, American women of the 20th century. So I'm not, Lorna, I think I'm not sharing my screen yet. So I'm going to start sharing my screen right now um, so you can see some pictures of Elizabeth and some of the work that she did, so. Um, you should be, uh, can someone type in the text uh, box and tell me if you're just seeing a picture, uh, a portrait of a woman in a red coat, uh, so that I know that it's working? Yes? Okay. And you're not seeing anything else except maybe the text box itself? Okay. Great. All right. We're good then. Um, so uh, in broad strokes, this is, this is Elizabeth Friedman. Um, uh, uh, Starting at age 23, she turned herself into one of the most uh, effective secret weapons of the US government. She was a code breaker. Um, the code breaker is someone who solves uh, secret messages without knowing the key. Essentially, she, she was a puzzle solver and she solved puzzles um, for uh, the highest stakes imaginable. Starting from absolutely nothing, starting as a poet, uh, an English major, uh, with no knowledge of, um, of code breaking at all. Uh, she was not trained in math at all. Um, she, she transformed herself into a master puzzle solver who essentially used pencil and paper to catch uh, some of the most um, dangerous people of her time. She, she solved messages during both world wars. Um, she used her code breaking skills to, to nab uh, gangsters, dangerous gangsters during prohibition. And, and then she embarked on a, a completely secret mission during World War II that was, that was secret until just a, a few years ago. Um, and I had to dig up in National Archives, which I'll, I'll tell you about that too. So, so I'll tell you about how all this happened. Um, and after I tell you the story, then um, I'd love to hear your questions. We're gonna have a, a Q and A. So uh, just to give you a sense of, um, of where I'm coming from, uh, how I got into this story. I'm, this, is not, this was not my college experience, right? I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a code breaker, uh, I'm a journalist. But, um, but I think I did know something about a code breaking when I started working on this um, project of researching Elizabeth Friedman and working on this book, because I think we all know something about code breaking. Um, codes and ciphers, what are these? So a code is, is just one thing that stands for another. Uh, uh, an example is a report card. A is good, F is bad. You know, a cipher is just a, a, a series of symbols that, that stand for other symbols um, uh, according to a, a formula. And, um, 
you know, I think a lot of us have have played around with um, very simple sorts of ciphers if we're solving the cryptogram or something. Um, uh, so we've all kind of been code breakers before. Uh, Elizabeth was doing this at a, at a much higher level, but I think we can all grasp the basic idea of, of what she did. And, and she herself, uh, all her life, when she gave public talks, she emphasized this. She said that um, you know we all we all kind of understand the basic concepts, and it's not something that's so remote uh, that we can't can't uh, connect with it or can't try to um, have fun with it or to understand the very important sort of national security and and secrecy and privacy and freedom implications of a lot of this uh, a lot of this technology. Um, so uh, uh, so where did I come into this story? Um, I'm not telling you this uh, because this how because it's particularly important about how I got into it, but I think it sort of gives some sense of Elizabeth and how unknown her story was before uh, a couple of years ago. So, um, so basically, uh, in 2013, I started reading about the um, Edward Snowden leak, which I'm sure a lot of you remember. This big story: National Security Agency contractor revealed that. Um, there was a secret program. Uh, the government was gathering large amounts of Americans' phone records and sort of analyzing this metadata. A lot of people were surprised by it. It became a huge global story. And at the center of it was the National Security Agency, the NSA, which is, has traditionally been um, you know, one of the most sort of secretive um, uh, government agencies because it's the agency that is, uh, that is tasked with finding um, analyzing uh, uh, the secret messages of uh, people in foreign countries and trying to understand what they're saying to each other. Um, you know, gathering those messages, breaking them, and then, and, and then reading them. And, um, and it's always been, it's always been uh, uh, very secretive. And so I started reading about the history of the NSA. And when you read about history of NSA, all roads lead to this guy. Uh, this is William Friedman. Um, and he's considered to be the godfather of the NSA. He is the one who, um, who kind of started it all. So if you go to NSA headquarters today, um, there's a bronze bust of his head outside of the, the main auditorium at, at NSA HQ. Um, and so I was reading about William Friedman and reading, trying to understand more about the NSA. And when you read about William Friedman, who was said to be sort of the greatest American code breaker of all time. He was, he was said to be a genius. He broke all kinds of messages. He had this amazing ability. When you read about William Friedman, um, usually there's, there's a mention uh, of his wife, Elizabeth Friedman. And, and I kept coming across this and it was usually framed like, um, uh, you know, William Friedman, this great code breaker, had a wife who was also a code breaker. And, um, and that was interesting to me uh, because uh, right off the bat, I wondered, you know, how many American couples um, uh, could there have been who were both uh, working as code breakers for the government? It seemed like a very interesting and kind of unique uh, situation, right? And I was curious, just on the basic human level of a husband and wife code breaker. Um, but I was also interested in, in knowing more about Elizabeth because uh, all of these mentions were, were very sort of brief of her in materials about William. And uh, I wanted to, Know more about her and, and about her code breaking career. So, uh, so I made my way one day um, to. I saw online that Elizabeth had left 22 boxes of her uh, papers, her diaries and letters, to a uh, to a private library in Lexington, Virginia, the George uh, Marshall Foundation Research Library, and the archivist there. I, I went there one day. I, I, I said who I was. I said I was interested in Elizabeth, and. Um, they were interested in me off the bat because a lot of people there who are interested in the Freedmen's go there to research William. I was interested in Elizabeth, so the archivists are wonderful. Um, they do incredible work. They took me back, and I'll never forget it. They took me back into the vault, which is behind this kind of metal door here, um, a thick metal door, and into this humidity controlled room. They showed me um, the materials that Elizabeth had left behind. It was 22 of these gray boxes filled with um, no one, no one. No one had had ever sort of produced an annotated guide for these things, so the archivist knew some of uh, what was inside, um, but there wasn't really a, a you know a, a map through the maze of the stuff. So I, I didn't know where to start. I, I just asked for box one, and I started reading file one and box one, and I spent the entire day there in the reading room um, uh, reading Elizabeth's letters from uh, when she was a young woman in her twenties. Um, you know, during World War One, and um, 
I very quickly realized reading, reading these letters that I had stumbled into something really extraordinary, that this is what every, every journalist, every author dreams of finding, which is um, an incredible story that hasn't been told before. Um, you know, it was a story of a code-breaking Quaker poet who, uh, who changed the 20th century, this kind of hidden woman behind the development of American intelligence and, uh, uh, and our code-breaking capacities. Um, she was a, um, she was a champion solver of messages, but uh, beyond that, she was an innovator uh, scientist who created entirely new methods of solving messages that had never been known before. And then she used those, those abilities to um, help us win some of the great conflicts of, of her life and, and our time. Um, uh, she wasn't just the best woman code breaker of, of that era. She was, she's one of the greatest American code breakers who ever lived, probably one of the greatest code breakers who ever lived. Um, and, and, and this was all, all in the boxes, or, or a lot of it was in the boxes, and, um, and I just hadn't read any of this before. And so I became completely obsessed with trying to find out everything about Elizabeth, not just that was in the boxes, but any of the papers that she had left. Um, and to solve some mysteries about her that had 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 been sort of laying there um, for a long time. So so now I'll take you uh, take you into Elizabeth's story. Uh, like I mentioned before, she did not start out as a mathematician. Uh, she started as a poet, and like a lot of things in life, um, her code breaking career began completely uh, by accident. I'm just going to check the chat to make sure that nobody is saying like uh, that you can't see what I'm. Okay, everything looks good. Um, okay, so this is a picture of Elizabeth in uh, college. She, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on her early life, but um, she, she was, she was born in Indiana at, in a large Quaker family. She was the ninth of nine children. Um, her maiden name was Smith, which she hated because she felt like it was extremely common. Uh, and she complained in her diary, uh, which is one of the first things I read at the library. Um, it seems that when I'm introduced to a stranger by this most meaningless of phrases, plain Miss Smith, I shall forever be in that stranger's estimation, illuminated from any category, even approaching anything interesting or at all uncommon. This is kind of a classic story of somebody who was born in a very small town, um, who finds uh, a lot of the things in the town uh, unsatisfying or boring, and essentially her, her main desire was to get out and find something uh, a little more exciting. And so um, she went to college against her, uh, her uh, father's wishes and she studied poetry, uh, Tennyson and Shakespeare. And um, she graduated with an English degree uh, in 1915. And she uh, was released into a labor market, an extremely sexist, obviously, labor market at the time where you know, the only jobs that were really available for college ed educated women who, who had studied poetry was to be uh, um, a school teacher. And so, um, so she got a job um, as a teacher in a, in a Indiana high school in a small town. And um, she didn't feel like it was what she wanted to do with her life. And so she, um, one day she just up and quit and she lit out for the big city of Chicago um she took the train there and she decided that she was going to try to find a more interesting job so she goes to chicago uh she goes around to all the employment agencies and she completely strikes out uh she's not able to find anything at all this is 1915 and um she's about to go home uh in total defeat um when on the last day she decides to um to visit someplace that she had read about in the paper and that had something that she wanted to see um, there was a private library in Chicago. I'm not sure if any of you have ever been there. Uh, the Newberry Library was essentially uh, designed and built as, as, a, as a gentleman's library, a, a library for rich gentlemen. And um, she'd read that they had a copy of uh, Shakespeare's first folio, which is one of the very, uh, which is the very first time that Shakespeare's plays had all been gathered in one place and, and printed. Uh, a very rare book. Um, from 1623, she had read about it, uh, studied it, studied about it in college, but she'd never seen one. And so she decided she was going to go to the Newbury Library and uh, take a look at this rare Shakespeare book. So she goes to the library and um, she's looking at the book, and um, 
the librarian there notices that she's interested in this Shakespeare first folio. And the librarian comes over to Elizabeth. She's, she's 23 years old at that point, very petite, um, very polite, uh, very humble. And the librarian comes over and says, you know, um, I see you're interested in the book. Do you, are, are you um, a Shakespeare fan? Do you know about Shakespeare? And Elizabeth says, uh, well, yes, I, I, I studied Shakespeare in college. And the librarian says, um, well, it's it's interesting. There's this there's this very odd, uh, uh, rich gentleman here in Chicago who comes to this library often and is pe is always peering at that book, sticking his face right in it, and um, and he says that he is looking for a research assistant to help him with a uh, uh, a research project related to to that book. Is that is that the kind of thing that you might be interested in as a job? And Elizabeth said, Yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. And the librarian went back to the desk and placed a phone call. And then came back to Elizabeth and said, uh, Mr. George Fabian will be here to pick you up momentarily. And um, sure enough, within an hour, um, this enormous uh, six foot four, 230 pound guy with, uh, you know, fiery uh, demeanor and, uh, and a beard comes, comes <laughs> pulls up to the library in a stretch limousine, uh, barrels into the library, walks right up to Elizabeth and without even introducing himself says, um, would you like to come out to Riverbank and spend the night with me? And Elizabeth came from a, a conservative Quaker uh, religious family and she's scandalized by this question. And um, she stammered something like, um, you know, I don't know my toothbrush. And Fabian says, uh, don't worry about it. That's okay. We'll provide everything out at Riverbank. And uh, basically grabs her by the arm and walks her uh, out to the limousine, takes her to the Chicago Northwestern train station, and off to Riverbank they go. So she has no idea what Riverbank is at that point. It turns out that Riverbank is, um, this is George Fabian and Elizabeth, the uh, picture taken like 1916, 1917. Um, it turns out that Riverbank is the, um, is, is, a, is a bizarre and kind of wondrous place of its time. Um, so George Fabian was, was a, a, a robber baron he was a textile merchant of Chicago, and um, you know he was wealthy. He wasn't as wealthy as as Frick or Carnegie, but he had a lot of money to throw around. Uh, but unlike those guys, he was completely uninterested in spending on lavish, you know, French impressionist paintings or in building castles like Hearst or anything. What made Fabian different was he was he was fascinated with science. He wanted to discover the secrets of nature more than anything, and um, and so he had he had he had built a uh, a kind of a rich man's state outside of Chicago in the uh, town of Geneva. And um, this is a 300 acre, in a lot of ways, it was, you know, like a typical rich man's uh, country estate at the time. But in many other ways, it was, it was completely atypical because George Fabian had, had transformed a, a large portion of Riverbank into a kind of mad scientist's laboratory. He had, he had built cutting edge um, scientific facilities there. And um, in an era before large research universities really uh, existed in America, he had turned Riverbank into de facto uh, private research university, um, uh, somewhat like Thomas Edison's uh, Menlo Park. And so um, he had all of these projects uh, going on out at Riverbank, um, uh, you know, projects about acoustics, projects about uh, projectiles and, and uh, military equipment, um, projects about genetics and breeding, uh, you know, all kinds of different strains, strains of plants. There was a very odd um, sort of secretive, mysterious projects related to radiation and, uh, and all kinds of other things like that. But his, his passion project that one he cared the most about was this Shakespeare project that he hired Elizabeth for. Um, it turned out that he had this—he had this theory that there were secret messages in this um, rare volume of Shakespeare. Fabian and other people of the time believed that um, William Shakespeare was not the true author of the plays. A lot of people believed that. Fabian kind of believed something beyond that, which is he believed that the true author of of the plays had inserted secret messages into the original printings. Um, that were that were written in a kind of cipher, and he wanted to discover the cipher, reveal the secret messages, and prove to the world that um, this this British Baron uh, Francis Bacon was the actual author of Shakespeare's plays. 
So he essentially hired Elizabeth, this 23-year-old poet, uh, to come out to Riverbank and to help um, upend the entire history of, of English literature by proving that Shakespeare wasn't Shakespeare. And to do that, she needed to find these secret messages in the book that, in the Shakespeare book that Fabian was convinced were planned there. Um, so Elizabeth joined this joined this team of, of um, Shakespeare researchers out of, out of Riverbank. This is a photo of them. And uh, I love showing this photo because um, you know, it's obvious that most of them are, are women. Um, Fabian, Fabian liked to hire women for this, this kind of work, finding secret messages and breaking codes because, he, because it took a lot of patience and he believed that, um, that women were inherently more patient than men. And they, they, just, they, they could stare for longer at these, at these pages and, um, and they complained less. And so he hired a lot of young women um, who showed, who showed uh, some kind of uh, literary ability and brought them out and, um, and put them on this project. Um, and Elizabeth started to work trying to find these secret messages in Shakespeare. And you know, inevitably, um, she failed. I'm not going to, to go into the, um, the details of, of why she failed, but um, she didn't fail because she was bad at it. She failed because the messages um, weren't really there. This, this all turned out to be a kind of uh, delusion, a wild goose chase. Um, Fabian and other people around him were, were kind of seeing something that, that wasn't really there. Um, but as Elizabeth was struggling with this uh, Shakespeare project, something else happened, something amazing, um, which is that she met the, the love of her life, uh, William Friedman. And uh, this is a, a photo of them, uh, I think around 1917, around when, they, around when they kind of first met and fell in love. This is, this is a kind of a classic story of of two, two young Americans uh, from, from different worlds meeting and falling in love. You know, Elizabeth came from this conservative Quaker family in the Midwest. Uh, William came from a Jewish family in Pittsburgh. He was a, uh, a geneticist and he had been hired by Fabian to, to come out and, and breed different strains of fruit flies and corn. But uh, William also had to be handy with a camera and because the Shakespeare project needed photo enlargements, um, they roped him into it. And, and pretty soon he was working on the Shakespeare thing. And very soon after that, he met Elizabeth. And then he was much more interested in Elizabeth than, than the Shakespeare stuff. Um, and this is just an example of, of some of the early letters that they wrote each other that are in the archives that I kind of fell in love with. Um, you know, I, when they were when they were learning about uh, codes and ciphers and starting to um, solve them, break them, they 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 began to incorporate them into their personal communications. You can see that they're signing off to each other in a kind of uh, code, which is, to me is, is just so striking and, and incredible. Um, their minds really, um, really clicked. There was something about the two of them that when they, um, uh, when they were working together, they, they weren't just twice as good. They were four times as good or, or 10 times as good. So they start working on these, um, on the Shakespeare project, trying to find these codes. They, they quickly realize it's, it's kind of a wild goose chase. But um, before long, it doesn't really matter because something happens in 1917 uh, that completely changes the project, which is that um, America enters the uh, war, World War One, um, and uh, World War One is uh, is the first war where uh, wireless communication by radio is is um, is a widespread phenomenon, and um, there's all kinds of messages flying through the air in Morse code all of the time and um, on the front. And because those messages can be intercepted by anyone with um, the, the right radio equipment, those messages had to be uh, written in code and cipher so that anybody uh, intercepting the dots, listening to the dots and dashes of Morse code, uh, wouldn't be able to figure out the message. And so uh, all of a sudden, there was this enormous uh, premium uh, placed on people who could solve these messages without knowing the key, could pluck them out of the air and, and find the, the hidden message inside. All of a sudden, there was this huge premium placed on code breakers. Um, and at the time, 1917, there was, there was really no American uh, agency or group of experienced code breakers, period. Uh, this is a time before the NSA existed. Um, you know, there was no CIA and the FBI was um, only a couple of years old. They had no code breaking capacity. And so all of a sudden the US Army realized that it needed experienced code breakers, they didn't have any. And so they, uh, in desperation, essentially, they appealed to George Fabian and 
um, and the folks out at Riverbank. And George Fabian essentially lent his uh, entire Shakespeare cipher team to the US Army um, as its code breaking operation, which is astounding to think about. Uh, it's one of those things in history that's actually um, actually stranger than fiction. You couldn't make it up, but uh, it's entirely true for the first six months uh, to a year of World War I, almost all of the US military code breaking was done by this group of people out here uh, on, in, this, um, in this kind of mad scientist laboratory on the Illinois Prairie. And I I, I, another reason I love showing this picture is that, um, you know, what you're looking at here is essentially the seed of the National Security Agency. You're looking at uh, the proto NSA. Okay, so the Shakespeare people go to war, and at the same end, they're starting to solve all these actual military messages. Um, and William and Elizabeth proved to be so good at it um, that very quickly they're going beyond everything that's known about code breaking in America because it's still young science in America. There's not a lot of code breakers. Um, you know, William and Elizabeth at age 23, 24 are very quickly, um, just by solving all these military messages, they're becoming some of the best in the country, and they turn out to have this innate genius at it as well. And very quickly, they're they're not just solving the messages, but they're inventing uh, entirely new uh, methods of solving them. So, um, uh, and they started to publish uh, under William's name because of the sexism of the era. Um, uh, they published these papers showing other people how to um, apply these new methods that they were inventing, this new science that they were creating together, how to use them to break codes. And um, through my research, I discovered that. These are essentially team efforts, although Williams is commonly the one who's credited uh, for these and whose name was on the cover. William considered them uh, uh, completely team efforts because he wrote Elizabeth's name on the inside cover above his on, on his own personal copies. Um, and um, I, I need to skip through the rest of their time at Riverbank or else I won't have the time to talk about anything else. Um, so suffice to say that um, they solved messages throughout the war, and around 1920, um, they have to make their escape from Riverbank because George Fabian turns out to be kind of um, jealous, overbearing. He had a, a, a tyrannical side. Um, he wanted to keep uh, the freedmen's there because he knew that they were incredibly valuable, and he considered them uh, to be his employees. He didn't want them working for the U.S. government or going anywhere else, um, like to the East Coast. They wanted to get out of there, so essentially they they uh, they they flat they they get out of uh, Riverbank in the middle of the night, and they go to Washington D.C. where the Army has offered them both jobs as code breakers. And in the new year in 1921, um, Elizabeth and William are uh, living D.C. and they're working for the Army. They're going to work every day together um, uh, after the war. And Elizabeth very quickly gets bored with uh, being a government employee, and uh, she doesn't want to do it anymore. Um, she, her ambition is really to um, to write children's books and to be an academic. Uh, she had no had no conception of of working for the government for the rest of her life. Uh, in 1923, the Freedmans had their first child, a daughter, and uh, so Elizabeth was a mom, so she's raising this kid, she's writing children's books, and she doesn't think at that point that she's going to do anything else in code breaking. But uh, the problem was that Elizabeth was uh, just too good at code breaking for uh, the US government to leave her alone. Um, they really didn't have anyone of, of, of her ability. And um, uh, she complained about this throughout her life, by the way. She, she said that you know men from the government are, are always showing up on my doorstep asking me to solve puzzles. And they'll give me an envelope and they won't leave until, until I return the envelope. But then I return the envelope, they just give you another envelope full of, full of puzzles and it just keeps going. Um, so in 1925, uh, um, a man shows up on her doorstep from the US Coast Guard, getting Charles Root. And the Coast Guard has a problem at that point, um, which is uh, prohibition, the rum war, and the rise of criminal mafias that are, that are smuggling liquor on the seas. Um, uh, you know, very quickly in Prohibition, we all know the story. Uh, this is kind of the rise of the mob. Um, it's controlling these liquor rackets. And uh, the way that they're coordinating their shipments on the seas is to, um, is to send uh, uh, encoded messages by radio. So there's, there's uh, somebody on the, on, the, on the rum ship 
uh, who has a radio, there's a pirate radio station on shore, and they're sending messages back and forth about their um, details of their drops. And the Coast Guard is intercepting these messages, but the Coast Guard doesn't have code breakers, so they can't read them. So, so these rum runners are, are you know, uh, running circles around the Coast Guard. And, uh, um, and these, are not, these are not sort of like the gentleman rum runners either of our common image. These are, um, these are like essentially large scale um, murderous mafias. And so they asked Elizabeth to come uh, work for the Coast Guard and start to solve these messages so they can figure out what these rum boats are doing. Um, and that's what Elizabeth starts to do in 1925. Um, Mrs. Friedman, please see what you can do with this and return it to us. She, they would give her these, these packets full of, full of messages and, um, and she would take them home and uh, she would solve them on, you know, by the fire with her sort of infant daughter there. Um, and, and the Friedman family dog, who they named Crypto. And she would, at home, working from home, she would, she would solve all of these messages that nobody else could solve and take them back to the Coast Guard. And, and, um, and then they would finally be able to figure out what these rum boats were doing um, because she wasn't, she was solving these messages that, that revealed um, the boat's locations and not just the boat's locations um, so that she was able to map them, but the names of the captains um, and, and essentially all of the details that would allow you to light up this kind of hidden underworld, um, all, all, of the, uh, all of the operational details of how these, how these boats were moving around in the water. Um, she's gathering this intelligence, giving it to the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard is able to use this and, and finally go in and, and, um, and kind of catch these guys. Um, and when she caught them, uh, these guys would have no idea what was happening. They, they, a lot of the time, they, they felt that their shipmates were ratting them out because they had no conception of uh, a woman in a in a coast guard office um intercepting all of their messages and breaking their codes that it just it never it never occurred to any of them and, and uh uh they, they couldn't conceive of it um uh, and this is where elizabeth you know one of one of the quotes of hers that i love the most is um is about her sort of mastery of 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 the science and the fact that it doesn't matter if if you can't conceive of of, of her abilities, she's going to kind of beat you anyway. So uh, she wrote one time that if I may capture a goodly number of your messages, even though I have never seen your code book, I may still read your thoughts. So she's learning about these guys and she's learning about these, a lot of these mafia guys, uh, like gangsters. I'm gonna skip through some of this stuff. This is just to give you a sense of the scope of the, um, these mafia network of uh, these mafia networks. Um, this is a, a particular um, mob network uh, run out of Vancouver. It's it's a map of their uh, radio links between the boats and the pirate stations. And as you can see, that's pretty sophisticated. So, uh, and she's she's solving thousands of these messages uh, every year, essentially alone at, at the Coast Guard. Uh, no team, no help, and ultimately. By the early 1930s, she was getting overwhelmed. So, uh, 1930, she she proposes to the Coast Guard. She says, "Like, hey, I need a team. I need you to create a code breaking team, and I want to run it. I want to be the cryptanalyst in charge, code breaker in charge." And so, um, the co uh, the Coast Guard at that point um, uh, says, "Okay," and they actually give her money to hire four or five people and train them. Which, at the time, 1930, U.S. government, this is absolutely unheard of for a woman to be leading a technical team. Um, uh, a code breaking team, absolutely unheard of, but it's only, it was only possible because Elizabeth uh, was, was so good at what she did and everybody who ever met her had to acknowledge it. Um, you know, even men who, uh, who would have preferred to um, use anybody else, they, 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 they had to uh, because she was the best. Um, so she creates this, uh, this unit at the Coast Guard uh, and they start to, um, they start, she starts to train people, she builds this team, they're working on the, uh, the rum ships and tracking them, but um, you know, 1930s uh, prohibition ends and the team uh, doesn't miss a step, they just start uh, intercepting gun shipments and heroin shipments instead of rum. And so um, this is a pattern with Elizabeth, by the way, as, as hard as she tried to sort of uh, dial down her, um, the stakes of her uh, puzzle solving adventures, it always kept going up. Um, 
and her her life only became wilder and more dramatic and 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 harder and higher pressure uh, as as the years went on. So she now she's now she's solving messages about international heroin um, rings, and uh, and because she is um, being at, there's there's a public aspect to this because um, prosecutors are using her um, solved messages to make court cases against uh, some of these gangsters and drug dealers. Uh, and uh, they need Elizabeth to come in and explain to the jury how she was able to uh, break their codes and, and get all the secrets of these guys. Um, and so what started happening in the, in the early to mid 1930s is that Elizabeth would go into a courtroom and uh, she would testify uh, in open court against some of these very dangerous uh, dudes. And she would explain exactly how she had gotten the best of them. And she started to become a, a kind of a sensation, um, uh, 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 a famous person. She was written about in, this is an example, they called it a lady manhunter, uh, true detective fiction weekly, a true story, you know, had her picture in papers. Uh, Ezra Gang falls in trap of woman expert at puzzles. This is a very typical kind of uh, story of that time. Solved by woman. I love that because it shows it shows the kind of condescending nature of a lot of the coverage that, uh, of her feats from that time. So I, I'm going to accelerate so that we can get to uh, get to questions, and I'll go through the next part very very quickly. But um, basically, the 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 one uh, gap in Elizabeth's records that I was faced with when I started the project was. Um, her World War II uh, work. So in, remember those uh, 22 boxes that I showed you in the Marshall Library, there's nothing in there from World War II. The, the records went up, went up to about 1939 and they stopped and they picked up and then they stopped and then there was a gap and then they picked up again at 1946, 1947. And when I asked around, nobody knew where Elizabeth's World War II records were or even if she had Done anything in the war? I was totally convinced that she must have done something in World War II because because I knew that the U.S. government could not have let her sit out the biggest conflict on earth. They would have needed her to do something, but nobody knew what it was. Um, and I asked around, and I and I became convinced that um, that it, the issue wasn't that the NSA was keeping her records in a safe somewhere. I I I became convinced that they were actually somewhere in the National Archives system, U.S. National Archives system. Um, which, which meant that they were potentially findable, but not necessarily. I don't know if any of you, of you have done research in the National Archives system, but it's kind of like that last scene in uh, Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark when they take the Ark and they, they put it into that crate and they wheel it into the government warehouse and there's you know thousands of, this is kind of like what it feels like to work in the National Archives system sometimes. But I, I spent um, a year and a half, uh, two years digging through uh, the archives at Annex 2 in uh, College Park, Maryland, Maryland and one day I found this, which is um, the entire secret history of Elizabeth's Coast Guard unit during World War II. Um, and I also found a, a set of uh, four binders that um, that that were uh, a collection of solved uh, messages that that she and her unit produced. This 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 uh, book is the kind of the technical history of how they of what they did during the war, World War II. And then I found the actual decrypts, the decrypted solved translated messages. And then I was able to put together a story and figure out which, what Elizabeth did during World War II, which was actually way better and, and more important and crazier tale than I had even expected, um, which I'm gonna go through very, very quickly. But um, uh, the, in broad strokes, she spent World War II on, a, um, on an ultra secret uh, assignment to track Nazi spies who were spreading through South America and track them by analyzing intercepted radio messages that they were sending to each other and breaking the codes and figuring out what these uh, German spies were saying to each other, gathering the intelligence, and then um, using that intelligence to send local authorities in to arrest these guys and then eliminate not dangerous Nazi spies from South America. South America, um, the Germans were spreading in there because um, they, wanted to watch uh, allied ships uh, that were using South American harbors. Um, and uh, the FBI uh, volunteered to do it. Jagger Hoover volunteered to do it, to do the job. Um, but the problem with Hoover is that um, 
he and the FBI didn't have any ability to break codes. They, they didn't have a code breaking team. All they had was this thing called the technical laboratory, which was essentially like a crime lab. Um, and, uh, you know, they would analyze uh, uh, fingerprints and that sort of thing. They, they didn't have a code breaking capacity, but uh, guess who did? Elizabeth and her Coast Guard team that she had been building, you know, in a sense, uh, Elizabeth and her team had been, you know, practicing on these rum runners for about 10 years. And it turned out that um, those, those skills were essential and valuable and directly, directly relevant to the job of tracking down Nazi spies in World War II because uh, the Germans were using uh, many of the same codes and ciphers as the rum runners and even using some of the same equipment. So I'm, I'm gonna skip through the actual sort of specifics of what she did because I don't have time and I wanna get to your questions. Uh, I'll show this because I, 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 I think it, it says a lot. This is just a, a comparison of the, the radio network of the, um, of the rum runners in the 1930s and, and one of the radio networks, uh, clandestine radio networks used by the Nazi spies in World War II. And you can see the similarity in structure. Um, you know, so Elizabeth ended up going after some big, big deal Nazi bad guys, including uh, this guy, uh, Johannes Siegfried Becker, he was an SS captain codenamed Sargo. She brought his entire spy ring to ruin, essentially, dozens and dozens of guys. She solved um, not just paper and pencil ciphers of uh, the old school, but she actually broke a couple of Enigma machines, which I get into the book, and I'm happy to talk about in questions if you have questions about uh, the Enigma aspect of what she did. And um, she ultimately sort of exposed, uh, through this work, exposed a secret connection between uh, the German spies and Argentine military forces. Um, there was a kind of a secret alliance involving uh, uh, this guy, uh, Juan Perón, and his wife, uh, Eva. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Evita. Um, anyway, uh, Elizabeth figured out that there, there was this relationship and the allies were able to, thanks to her work, go in and put a stop to these um, to these German spies. And, kind of bring them to ruin. Um, and I found all the documentation of, of the success of what she did, but I never found any information about, um, about Elizabeth's role in it, uh, except what I was seeing in the sort of in the primary documents that I dug up in, in the archives. This wasn't publicized. She never got credit for any of this stuff. Um, and there's two reasons uh, why, you know, this amazing story of an American housewife sweeping South America free of you know, Nazi spies during World War II. It's an incredible story, but there, there's a couple of reasons why we never heard this story before. And one is that her work was um, classified top secret ultra after the war, put into these classified vaults. It was only declassified in, I think, 2000. And the other reason is that Hoover, Jager Hoover, um, uh, stole credit from Elizabeth and the Coast Guard for the work that they had done. He went out uh, in public and he claimed uh, that the FBI had done it when, in fact, um, uh, Elizabeth and the Coast Guard was kind of saving, saving them from their own um, inability or incompetence. And uh, the result is that Hoover was able to grow the glory of the FBI and his own glory, and that Elizabeth after the war was uh, fired. Not just her, but her entire team was fired by the Coast Guard. I did not survive. So, so that was the World War II tale. And, uh, and um, there's a lot more that I could talk about, but uh, I will say that Elizabeth and William in their retirement um, became, uh, they sort of returned to their roots as, as, uh, as educators and researchers and scientists. And they spent a lot of time assembling an archive of a lot of the work that they had done. And while they weren't able to talk about the World War II work directly, Elizabeth, I think, was able to kind of like insert a couple of hints um, in those records that, you know, ultimately helped lead uh, me to uh, the truth of what she had done in, in World War II. Um, and so I think that ultimately uh, she, she, kind of, she kind of got her revenge. Um, this was the only uh, time I ever found any sort of glancing reference in the, art, in the Marshall Library to what she had done in World War II, by the way, is this sort of total aside where she said, uh, you know, that's what I did, the spy stuff. So, uh, so now we know a lot of the story and uh, I'm able to talk about it with you and uh, and I'm really curious to hear your uh, your questions 
and uh, and I just thank you for being interested in the tale because I think that um, I think that's really important to kind of to know the accurate history. Um, and this this the version of the story with Elizabeth and Coast Guard in it, um, you know, is is the truer version of the tale. Uh, it's possible now to kind of put these pieces of Elizabeth's life back together and to give her the, the credit that and the attention that that she deserves and by you know being interested in the story and listening tonight and um, you're you're helping that to happen so so thank you Jason thank you this is such a fascinating story and one of those untold stories of women that often get um, swept under you Absolutely. have um, quite a few qu um, questions here um, are any of her children or grandchildren alive? And how has this information been saved? How has the information been, what, um, do you know what information they're referring to? Um, all of the, all of her code breaking, I'm, I'm assuming, so. How has it been saved? Um, yeah. And then also so, about her kids and grandkids. So about the kids, um, uh, so they they had the Freedmans had two children, uh, John Ramsey and Barbara, and they were both um, they had both died by the time I started working on the book, so I wasn't able to talk to them. But um, but they left a lot of letters that are in the archive, um, and a lot of them are wonderful, and they they definitely contributed to the picture of what uh, what Elizabeth and William did in their lives, and um, and she does have um, descendants. You know, I, I was I, who are who are alive and are. Are, uh, still have some stories about her. I, I spoke with uh, uh, Elizabeth's grandson, a uh, really interesting guy named Chris, uh, who told me a bunch of uh, great stories about about Granny. Um, and there's and there's a there's a whole side of the family that um, that never left Indiana um, that is is really interested in, in Elizabeth and her legacy now. And, have organized a family reunion around uh, Elizabeth and you know some of the some of these historical details that have been on earth uh how how was her code breaking information saved so a lot so in that archive in those 22 boxes there was a lot of um a lot of her original code worksheets she preserved Elizabeth and, and William were absolute pack rats when it came to pieces of paper they never threw anything away uh any however uh you know minor the scrap and uh and so you can actually see the work of their pencil um, from a hundred years ago, uh, with, with stunning immediacy. If you if you handle these handle these records um, at the Marshall Foundation Library, it's 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 extraordinary. Actually, um, you can you can you can sort of see see the mark the mark of their pencil, and you can imagine them solving these puzzles. Um, and all of that all of that is there. Uh, all of that is there if you if you go there and ask for the boxes, and you can look put the gloves on. You can look at them look at them yourself. It's really an incredible experience. Cool. So did her children ever know what she did? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I don't think they knew until, until years after World War II. And um, even then, I don't think they really knew. Um, not until both of their parents had died because, because Elizabeth and William um, were they worked. They worked their entire careers under, you know, extraordinary pressures of secrecy. They were not supposed to talk uh, with anyone outside of their own teams about what they did. I mean, they were not even. They were not even supposed to talk with each other about it, which is amazing to think about. You know, husband and wife were both working uh, as codebreakers for different parts of the U.S. government during World War II. You know, Elizabeth for the Coast Guard and um, the Navy, and and uh, William for the Army. And they were both solving these incredibly high stakes problems, and they weren't able to, you know, get comfort from each other, or talk, talk, talk shop. William William complained bitterly about this. He he said he always said that um, if it were up to his boss, the army, then he and Mrs. Friedman would sleep in separate beds at night for reasons of national security. And uh, I think it was a real strain and a real uh, burden on them both. Great. And there are uh, a few questions about her husband. Um, basically, what was he doing during this year? Because we heard her stories, sure. um, but also, um, did they was he involved in her work and she in his? And did they have? Did he have another job? And where did they live during World War II? 
Yeah, so they both lived in uh, in Washington D.C. on Military Road, and you know, by outward appearances, they lived a fairly you know normal uh, middle class existence, and um, um, and it was really almost nobody who knew what they were actually doing um, at their day jobs. So Elizabeth was working for uh, the Coast Guard with her team. Meanwhile, William uh, uh, continued working for the Army. And the army gave him a series of sort of uh, tasks and, and teams of escalating importance and and uh, and secrecy. During World War II, he led uh, an army codebreaking team that famously ended up uh, solving uh, and cracking the Japanese version of the Enigma machine, uh, which was called Purple. Uh, the, the, the biography that was written of William in the 1970s was called The Man Who Broke Purple. And this is a um, this is a really important achievement um, because it allowed essentially the, the Japanese were using these um, cipher machines to um, diplomats were using them to communicate with their um, counterparts in the Nazi regime. And so, um, you know, after William and his team uh, broke this purple machine, they were able to read um, all of the most secret communications of these Japanese and Nazi diplomats. And it allowed um, it created a stream of intelligence throughout the war that became known as magic, because it because um, because because it was so extraordinary that they were able to sort of read these secret um, communications, and it gave um, it gave Allied commanders the jump on the enemy uh, in a in a number of decisive battles, and probably probably ended up shortening the war by a year or two. Um, so an immense, an immense achievement, one of the kind of one of the most famous achievements of. Um, code breaking history and, and and you know whereas Elizabeth's achievement was not sort of um, was not uh, really memorialized um, or or trumpeted at all Williams Williams was uh, that's 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 a, a famous story that that has been passed down about about him great thank you there are several questions that relate to her work against the mob so um, okay. So one, was her life ever in danger because she testified against the mob? And if she testified against them, wouldn't her identity and job be known? And were there those risks? Yeah, those are really good, really, really good questions. So the answer to the first question is yes, she was in danger. She always kind of brushed it off, um, but the Secret Service assigned, um, assigned her bodyguards. And for a time in the, in the 1930s, they were actually, um, they actually stayed with Freemans at their house full time, although she did not let them bring their guns into, into the house because she grew up Quaker and and uh, and she grew up believing that uh, guns were guns were a, a, a religious violation. So um, so yes, uh, she was in danger. Um, testifying in court wouldn't her job um, become known and her methods become known? Yes, uh, absolutely. And that's a, that's a really interesting thing to think about. Um, you know, a, a lot of a lot of the a lot of the justification of, of um, today of keeping keeping these techniques secret is that uh, if you talk about the techniques uh, out in the open, then the enemy understands uh, what you're doing to you know uh, to get the advantage, and they adapt. They change their they change the the method that they're using to communicate secretly, and you can't read their messages anymore. Um, you know. That's that. There's always been a tension uh, between that and um, and um, prosecutors trying to win cases. And I think the the balance back in the 1930s was um, the pendulum was more toward prosecutors trying to win cases and put these guys in jail. And so they were willing to they were willing to risk, uh, you know, divulging the the methods of the code breakers um, in order to. Um, in order to get the convictions, and um, that was actually that actually created some problems for Elizabeth. Although she had no control of it, she was basically ordered by um, ordered by the prosecutors to do this work. She she didn't she wasn't sort of the master of her own destiny in that regard. Um, but um, there were people in the code breaking community who um, who felt that she um, that her testimony in these cases was was harming their ability to be able to read the next secret message to anyone. Cool, thank you. Um, and in that regard, because she did work for the Coast Guard, is she in the Coast Guard's records? Yes. Uh, 
so the Coast Guard in World War II was was subsumed into the Navy. So a lot of the Coast Guard records um, are are classified in the Navy files um, for the World War II portion. But yes, uh, you know, before the war, the, um, her records are in Coast Guard files in National Archives. And um, you know, the Coast Guard since since the book came out, the Coast Guard has taken a lot of really uh, interesting and cool steps to kind of acknowledge uh, her celebrate her and um you know and um and talk about the history of uh, coast guard code breaking and and um you know and women in coast guard code breaking they're they're actually they're they're, they're building right now a ship uh, that's named after her in uh, mississippi the, the national security cutter uh it's named friedman in in her honor so they're they're definitely they're definitely recognizing the, the work that that she did which i which i think is great Yes, that is really great. Um, where did um, Elizabeth and William spend their retirement years? Mm. Um, so it, they they stayed in DC. Uh, they moved they moved from a a the house on Military Road into um, um, into I, I think a, a row home um, on Capitol Hill and. I'm I'm struggling to remember the the street right now, but um, they they uh, they spent a lot of time uh, in the house in their retirement, um, um, curating their own private library. Now, all of the books that they had collected, all the all of the records, all the papers. Like I said, they were pack rats, and um, and they worked on a, a book project together that I talk about in the book, and. Um, and uh, and ultimately, um, there was there was an, there was a famous episode that I that I talk about in the book as well, where um, the uh, the government sent men to uh, remove files from their private library, believing that they were uh, that they should be classified. And uh, William and Elizabeth felt that this was uh, uh, a deep violation of their of their privacy, and they never they never got over it. That was that was the moment where they sort of um, they. They they turned, um, they started to kind of resent, uh, resent the these government agencies that they had been a part of, uh, of helping to to build and um, and uh, and they started to feel that they, they they became much more interested and concerned with talking about uh, talking about privacy after that. It's just an, kind of an interesting change. That's true. Uh, how was she first brought to your attention? It wasn't really brought to my attention. It was more that I was just reading and I got curious about something and I started poking around, um, which is a great thing. You know, if you're a journalist, this is basically what you do uh, all the time, every day. <laughs> uh, so I, it's just become, a, I guess, a, a habit. Um, but um, but yeah, it was reading those. It was reading those um, those men, those mentions of Elizabeth in stories about William, and, and that made me think. You know, I wonder if there's something else there, and. Um, there might not have been anything anything there, um, but um, but I, I started to I started to go looking, and then I like I said I just stumbled into this incredible gold mine of of stuff, and then from there I was just off to the races. Yes, totally, very cool. Are there any other books in the works that you're working on? Um, I I'm not. I right now I'm a full time reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper. A news outlet and um i really like that i like my team so so i'm uh i'm essentially uh i'm a full-time as opposed to being an author working for myself i'm a uh, full-time sort of employee of um, of the chronicle so my days are my days are structured uh structured differently now and, uh, but i'm but i'm always looking for um you know topics um uh, and and stories uh, uh that that could become books, and um, and I'm definitely looking for something that that grabs me, um, and obsesses me in the way that that this one did. Because because um, when that when that feel when that feeling hits, and it's it's a really uh, it's a really good one. And working on this book was uh, was um, particularly the research, the, de the detective part of it was a joy. Yes, it it is such a fascinating story and your book is really great has lots of really great little stories in it that um, are really interesting 
Um, something else is one of the participants said, are you going to do a Hollywood, Hollywood film on this? <laughs> because they thought it was really good. So how long did it oh, take thank you, you yeah. to write? Uh, it was about four years from start to finish. Uh, it depends on sort of where you start counting, but um, but yeah, I would say the real the real sort of intensive period of research and writing was three and a half four years. Although I I, I kind of had the idea a little bit before that. Uh, as as for a Hollywood movie, yeah, absolutely. If anybody out there knows Reese Witherspoon, it's uh, your like personal friends with uh, Jessica Chastain or something, or anybody who would want to play Elizabeth, then definitely text them and tell them about the book, please. Um, there, there, are, there, there, there is something uh, uh, kind of in the works now, but it's in early stages. And, uh, but yeah, I would love, I would love to see, I would love to see the story told, uh, told on the screen. I think it'd be great. It is really great, and there is a PBS documentary that I know you're featured in, and some of your work is featured in. Yeah, it's, it's terrific. On, they did a really good job with it. Yeah, on Elizabeth Friedman. The name of his book is "The Woman Who Smashed Coats." Oh, I want to thank wonderful. you so much because this story is so very fascinating and it's one of those stories that you just don't hear that's so important in our history especially when we start looking at how world war ii played out and how um the coast guards challenges with the rum running in the mob. i want to thank you all for joining us tonight jason thank you for sharing your fabulous stories um, we really appreciate your time. So. Oh yeah, thank you, Lorna, and thank you everyone for for listening. I, I really enjoyed it, and your questions are terrific.